On a wall in the headquarters of the United Nations hangs a replica of the first ever international peace treaty. Known by many names, the Egyptian Hittite Treaty, the Treaty of Kadesh, the Eternal Treaty and the Silver Treaty. This was a treaty agreed upon in 1259 BC, rediscovered in 1906, between the two greatest powers of the Bronze Age, Egypt's 19th dynasty and the Hittite Empire. Before we begin going over the details of this treaty, I must first clarify a few points. This is the first ever formal peace treaty that history we know of and have a copy of. There were other treaties and agreements in the past between nations, however, these were either informal, as in no more concrete than a handshake or simple pinky promise, or have since been lost to history. War had been waging between the two powers for over the border region of the North Levant, which both empires claimed to be theirs. This land frequently changed hands during this period. However, it was not until Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, met the Hittites to partake in the first ever pitched battle that is recorded to the point where we know the tactics and the troop formations used throughout the battle. It is also argued to be the largest chariot battle ever fought. Its outcome is debated, mostly because both sides describe it as a victory for themselves. Most historians, however, now see it as a draw, because neither side could really prove more dominant than the other. More battles were fought around the same region, however the conclusion is the same. No serious progress could be made. And so, a treaty was agreed upon 16 years after the battle. The treaty goes as follows. Both parties must make pledges of brotherhood and peace with one another, and enter into an alliance renouncing all past hostilities. An official border was decided, and an endless peace was agreed upon by the law of the treaty, which also bound the children and the grandchildren of both parties. The alliance part of the treaty comes from an agreement between the two, to militarily assist each other when attacked internally or by a third party invader. Each side had to hand over any hostages taken. Ramses II also agreed to support the Hittite king's chosen successor as the future king of the Hittite Empire. Finally, the gods were called upon to oversee the treaty, and curses were bound to it, forcing the two empires to the treaty not only physically, but spiritually. Although those were what the treaty specifically states, historians assume there were other purposes to this treaty. The friendly relations would open up trade, and Ramses II wanted access to Hittite ports, allowing him to vastly expand the wealth of Egypt. An alliance would also help both sides deal with the growing power to their east, the Assyrians. However, it would seem even this treaty would not be enough, as the Hittite Empire fell to the Assyrians in less than a century after the deal. Also, some argue that the Egyptians knew of the sea people by this point, and Ramses feared a war on two fronts. Lastly, there is the factor of legitimacy to consider. An official legal treaty signed between two states, overseen by the gods, not only legitimises the border, but also provides legitimacy to the two rulers who agreed upon those terms. The Hittite king especially had legitimacy problems in his empire. He had usurped the throne from his nephew, who sought refuge with the Egyptians. Not only would a treaty legitimise his position in his own empire, but it would also shield his position from his nephew staging an Egyptian-supported coup. Further evidence of this 
effects shown as both powers propagandized the war as a victory for themselves, both claiming to have won, adding further legitimacy to their names among their own people. This here is the Hittite version of the treaty, found in modern day Turkey. Two parts of this treaty reside in the Istanbul Archaeology Museums, whereas the third piece is currently in the Berlin State Museums. And this here is the Egyptian version, still residing in Egypt, to the best of my knowledge. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed and learned something. Subscribe to support the project, and next week I will be going over the exact details of the Rosetta Stone. Everyone talks about its importance for unlocking the past, but nobody talks about what it actually says. This has been the history of diplomacy.